Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you for tuning in wherever you are. Um, it's May the 1st, obviously. Uh, that means that the new stay at home order uh, that has been extended uh, is in effect, uh, and for the next uh, two weeks till May the 15th. Uh, part of that order, and this is simply a way of reminding folks, it requires employees uh, interacting with the public to wear masks, but I'm also, or facial coverings, uh, I'm also encouraging all Louisianans to mask up. Anytime that you are around people uh, who are not in your immediate household, uh, and that's true whether you're inside or outside. Remember, when you ma wear a mask, you're protecting others, and when others wear masks, they're protecting you. And it's an important part of slowing the spread, uh, and we need to do this along with the social distancing and the hygiene and other things in order to make sure that we can move um, into phase one of the reopening uh, on May the 15th. It's also just kind of the neighborly thing to do. And so we're encouraging you to do that. Both the CDC and the Louisiana Department of Health uh, recommend uh, the mask usage. We've been working to share information uh, with Louisianans in many, uh, many households have received a phone call from me uh, earlier today and I just want to assure people that that was real. Uh, we make those calls to landlines and to people who opt in for messages on their cell phones. And you can sign up for this by registering for SMART911 at coronavirus.la.gov. That's coronavirus.la.gov. Today, we are reporting 710 new cases of COVID-19 for a total of 28,711. Now, that's a larger increase than we've reported um, in a number of days. Uh, and it is somewhat startling, but I want people to understand that 381 of these new cases came from two commercial labs who were reporting for the very first time today. And many of those test results are days and actually weeks old, we found out. Um, Obviously, this is going to happen on occasion as new labs come online for the first time. We are working with the labs, making sure that they know that they are under an obligation to report not just the LDH, but also the CDC, uh, all of their uh, results. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, but we, we are reporting the 710. If you take away the 381 of those that came from those two labs, it puts us more in line with where we've been over the last number of days. Unfortunately, we do have 65 new deaths to report today, bringing the total deaths to 1,927. So it strikes me that we're getting very close to 2,000. It seems like just the other day we broke the 1,000 um, mark. And obviously we grieve for every single one of those individuals uh, and we should keep their families in our thoughts and prayers. Currently there are 1,607 patients hospitalized across the state of Louisiana with COVID-19. That is plus six since yesterday. There are 230 on ventilators. That is down one from yesterday. And we are reporting that we've completed 168,251 tests across the state. So as you can see, hospitalizations and ventilator usage are better overall across the state over the last number of days. Um, but I do want to remind you that this is not true for every region of the state. We are very proud of all the progress that has been made overall, and especially in Region 1, uh, the Orleans Parish, Jefferson Parish area, uh, especially when you consider where we were just a few weeks ago um, with case growth growth leading the country, in fact, leading the world here in Louisiana, almost all of it focused uh, down in, in that particular area. But if you just focus on Orleans and Jefferson Parish uh, and you see the improvements there, then, then your, your perception of, of reality is actually skewed uh, if you try to look at what's happening across the state as a whole because the progress is not even. Now, the good news is that where we have growing cases and, and hospitalizations, it's not the, um, the rapid rise uh, that we were seeing in New Orleans at, at one time, but it's still very uh, concerning. 
obviously the bottom line is that we have more work to do and that's what I'm trying to get the people across Louisiana to focus on as we move through the next uh, two weeks May 15th will be here I think before we know it um, but we have work to do to continue to slow the spread and and that's why we need to follow the, the stay home uh, order continue to social uh, distance and follow the hygiene practices that we've been talking about and I would remind individuals that the White House guidelines uh, have those three criteria that we need to meet. Uh, one is symptoms, the COVID-19 like symptoms that are being reported at emergency rooms across the state of Louisiana, uh, the number of cases across the state, and certainly hospitalizations. You've heard us uh, talk about, and you've seen signs yourselves of what we've been talking about, of flattening uh, the coronavirus curve and, and I want everyone to, to understand that, that I appreciate and they should all appreciate uh, the work that, that Louisianans are putting in to make this happen because, because it has happened uh, in large part. Um, but just like this past Sunday when we, you really dig into the data, you do see some areas where it's not quite so rosy. You know, and, and uh, I'm reminded uh, of, of what I was taught at, at West Point and in the Army, you never want to fight and bleed and die uh, for the same terrain twice. And so when you make progress, you don't want to give it up uh, and, and, then, and then see the cases spike again and have to go back uh, to more restrictions, which is, which is uh, obviously the, the reason that, that we chose uh, to follow those guidelines. We didn't meet them, uh, and, and we, we needed to um, stay where we were for the most part uh, in order to, to make sure that those three things were all moving in the right direction before we uh, proceed to phase one. I do want to show you what uh, the data actually looks like, in, especially in the areas of concern, and I'll show you uh, graphic number one now. So this information is actually comes from the CDC itself. Uh, and they are tracking down uh, at the parish level, uh, and they prepared this information. And, and this is why it's dated uh, as of April the 24th. This is what we were looking at uh, this past uh, Sunday. Uh, the, these very slides uh, right here. Um, these uh, CDC epi curves calculate the three-day moving average of daily changes and in incidence of infection per 100,000 people. Each column represents the day-to-day -day difference in the three-day average and is then color-coded based on the slope um, and low or ho I'm sorry, low or high incidence. These curves, as I mentioned a while ago, include cases through April the 24th. It shows uh, some some problems areas, as you can see. Uh, Regions 2, uh, Baton Rouge, uh, Region 4, and Cadiana uh, and 8 uh, up in the Monroe area are increasing. Uh, region 9, the North Shore, uh, has, has plateaued. Uh, so this is what we were, we were looking at this past Sunday. With respect to uh, hospitalizations, uh, then these are the three regions that, that I wanted to show you about. This is more up to date because it contains data through April the 30th. Um, this is measured using hospitalizations per capita reported to the Department of Health. It is slightly different than we saw last week and it's actually a little bit better. Um, and, and that's obviously good news. We're, we're seeing progress. But the data does show three problem areas still with respect to hospitalizations. Uh, those being in regions two, um, Baton Rouge, uh, and eight, uh, Monroe, which both have hospitalizations increasing uh, currently uh, and uh, hospitalizations uh, plateauing in the Region uh, 6 area, which is in central Louisiana. So the Monroe area uh, is the area of greatest concern uh, at, the, at the moment. Um, and remember, there's a 7 to 14 day lag time between when you have contact with someone or with the virus. It doesn't have to be someone. Um, and when those symptoms show up, when the test results come in and, and, and so forth. Um, so I wanted to, to make sure that we're reminding people uh, of that. Now, bottom line is we still have some work to do, and, and that's what we're, we're trying to impart to people. 
I did want to remind folks, too, that uh, with a few exceptions, non-emergency medical and surgical procedures uh, are now open. And so we're encouraging, uh, this is true both inpatient and outpatient hospitals, but also at clinics and, and even at, at dental offices. This opened up on this past Monday. So if you have a health condition, a disease, some illness, some condition, and you've been putting off uh, going to see the doctor, uh, you might want to re-engage. It's a great time to re-engage with your providers to see whether now is the right time for you uh, to come in uh, for a visit uh, and to have an outstanding matter taken care of. I can tell you that based on the guidance that we have given from the Department of Health to the clinics and the hospitals, all the various health care providers, uh, it is safe to do so. They're going to make sure that they're following social distancing uh, the, the use of PPE will be what's required. They're going to be cleaning the area more frequently and, and so forth. But we say this because it was a reason that we opened up these procedures again, and that is because uh, our population is less healthy than we want it to be, uh, and we need people to be as healthy as they can possibly be should they be exposed to this virus because that's going to uh, better enable them uh, to, to fight it off and, and to have the best possible uh, result. So I do encourage people to, to reach out to their providers if they've been putting uh, something off uh, as it relates to their medical condition and treatments. Before I take questions, um, I do want to say that uh, with the legislature returning to Baton Rouge next week, we're going to be making some adjustments as to when and where uh, we hold uh, these briefings because uh, I'll be moving back to the state capitol in the afternoons at least. Uh, and uh, my brief, uh, communications team is going to release more details on what you can expect going forward um, later today. I have a couple questions from the public that I wanted to get to today. First, Nick from Baton Rouge. He says, with testing increasing, how soon before tests will be available for everyone, especially those who are asymptomatic? It's a really good question. Uh, and obviously the goal is to get to where we have tests available uh, for everyone, but, but we're not increasing our capacity to test uh, that rapidly, so we're, we're certainly not there. Um, but we are in the process of ramping up our testing capacity, uh, which is why you heard me talk yesterday about uh, when I went to the White House and we talked about the 200,000 tests per month. Uh, that, that we intend to do going forward starting in the month of May uh, to get to 4.3 percent of our population. But at that level, we are not going to have enough to go to asymptomatic people uh, across our entire population. Uh, and in fact, the plan that uh, Dr. Burks uh, put forward, her, her blueprint, her plan for testing, doesn't uh, call for that. Asymptomatic people will be tested uh, but in those sentinel settings, uh, so it's healthcare providers, it's, it's people who are living in nursing homes or potentially people in prisons or jails and in congregate, congregate settings um, where it's most important that we get our testing to them. Um, so that was a, that was a great uh, question, but we're just not there yet, Nick. And, and as soon as we can get there, we will certainly let you all know. However, anybody who becomes symptomatic needs to be tested. Uh, and contact your provider if you have any questions about that. Call two one one two one one. Ben uh, from Lake Charles has asked a question. When it comes to food preparation, who should wear masks? The preparers, the waiters, delivery drivers, etc. Well, this is actually a common question that we're getting these days, and I want to thank him for asking it. Um, and I'll remind everyone again: the extended stay-home order requires that employees of any business who interact with the public must be wearing a mask or other facial covering. And that is at all times when they're dealing with, with the public, with their customers. Uh, and so certainly that would include waiters and delivery drivers. Uh, both the CDC and the Department of Health here in Louisiana are recommending that every person over the age of two or who doesn't have some breathing uh, condition or difficulty uh, wear that mask or facial coverings. And they should do so anytime uh, that you are near others who are not uh, part of your immediate household, whether you're indoors or outdoors. That mask is meant to protect others from you, and when they wear a mask, it's meant to protect you 
uh, from them so as to be in good neighbors again. So with that, uh, I am going to pause from my prepared remarks and take some questions. Leo. Uh, the legislature is coming back in next week, correct? Yes, sir, Monday. All right. Uh, yesterday, uh, our protesters stormed the state capitol in Michigan, and I found this unbelievable, but it's legal to carry firearms into the capitol in Michigan. Uh, in fact, when they tried to storm onto the floor of the Senate, the state police finally stopped them as senators started to grab uh, bulletproof vests. I don't expect anything like that here, yeah. but what provision have we made to prevent that kind of scenario here? Well, um, the laws are a little different here, for, for one. Um, you're not allowed to carry a weapon like that in, into the Capitol. But, but number two, like you, I don't expect to see that. Now, obviously, we have some individuals around the state uh, who uh, want to give voice to their opinions, which are different than mine at, at the moment with respect to the necessity of the stay-at-home order. Um, and, and they have ample opportunity to, to do that. Um, and, and, you know, that's part of being an American. It's part of living in Louisiana. I would ask those individuals to do so in, in, in obviously an appropriate, uh, safe manner. Um, and, and, and if they do that, then there, there won't be uh, any problems like, like you saw in Michigan. And, and I, like them, uh, I look forward to the day uh, when we can ease these restrictions, open up more of our economy, get more uh, businesses open, get more people back to work. Uh, and I would remind uh, folks of a couple of things um, while we're talking about it. The plan that we are following um, with, with, I believe, great fidelity is the plan that the White House put forward that has been vetted by the CDC. Uh, and so that's, that's what we're doing, and that's why you didn't see uh, the President voice any displeasure or disagreement uh, with the decisions that we've made here in Louisiana. Uh, with respect to the phased approach of, of uh, reopening our economy. The second thing I would remind people is there are, are many businesses in Louisiana uh, that were never closed, unlike happened in other states, um, particularly in retail uh, across the state of Louisiana. Uh, and we've already gone to the uh, non-emergency medical and surgical procedures being reopened. Uh, we're moving forward. Um, today with respect to uh, on-premises dining uh, outdoors for, for restaurants and, and um, curbside pickup at malls. And so we, we're doing what, what we believe we can reasonably do right now to ensure that those cases don't spike back up, especially before we have that additional testing capacity, which we expect to start coming in uh, in earnest over the next week. Uh, but, but I do believe uh, that we will, we will continue to have some individuals here in Louisiana who will want to protest. Uh, I would just encourage them to, to do that in a safe, appropriate way. Their voices are being heard. They're going to continue to be heard. Um, and and we're, going to, we're going to get through this, uh, I, can, I can just assure you. Um, but if, in the meantime, I need everybody to be focused on the fact that we have to meet those threshold criteria. Um, and that means we need to, over the next... Uh, two weeks, take advantage of this time to keep the, the case spread down uh, so that we don't send more people back uh, into the hospitals and, and that we can proceed to phase one. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is it fair to say that the cases in Baton Rouge and the other regions that you looked at Sunday and the hospitalizations in Baton Rouge and elsewhere, are those the main challenges we have to get past in order to move to phase one on May 15th? Well, that's fair to say as of today based on the data that we're seeing. Um, but again, we, we're going to have uh, another period of time that we're going to be evaluating the entire state, the state as a whole, and every, and every region. So I don't know if, if uh, in three days it might be another one. I'm hopeful that, that, uh, that the entire state, uh, by every region and the state as a whole, will, will look better. But it is, it is the slide that we showed you today it was actually prepared by the CDC itself based on test results and dated with the data from the 24th of April. That's the actual slide um, among many others that informed my decision on this past Monday uh, to extend the stay home order. So, so yes, that's our current concern uh, in addition to the information that we gave you about hospitalizations that is, that is more current. 
I don't know, and, and this is what I'm trying to be careful with, I don't know if a week from now it will be those same regions. Uh, hopefully, hopefully every single region will be doing better. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to the outdoor dining um, mm -hmm. implementation starting today, obviously when you came in here Monday and made the announcement of the extension of the yeah. stay-at-home order, uh, not what you wanted to do, not what you would expect it to do, but was allowing that outdoor dining maybe a consolation? I know we can't give you all mm -hmm. we wanted to, but we can at least go this far and then with beautiful weather expected this weekend. Is there any part of you that's nervous that restaurants or residents may, you know, take the leniency in some places yeah. a little bit too far? Well, I guess you always have uh, a little bit of concern that people are going to do things that they really shouldn't do that are inconsistent with uh, the CDC guidance and with the various orders that we have issued. Um, what I don't have any concerns about is if the restaurants will operate within the guidelines we've given them and if the Louisiana people will operate within those guidelines, then we're going to be just fine. And I wouldn't say it's a consolation at all. Um, it's an understanding that uh, the risk of transmission is much diminished outdoors uh, compared to indoors, uh, where the air is still and the air that you have is typically recirculated by an air conditioner that, that kind of takes everybody's virus, circulates it and blows it, blows it back on, on other people. And so it's just a recognition of that um, and trying to, to make sure that we can do what is safe uh, and what also should help the economy, especially with those restaurants who are able to take advantage of it. Uh, but then putting those restrictions on there so that you're going to continue to have the social distance. You're not going to have weighted uh, tables and, and, and so forth. Uh, I, you know, we just believe that, that that's safe. And so I, I wouldn't call it a consolation uh, of any sort. It's just a progression as we as we open up the economy going forward. Yes, sir. Two labs today responsible primarily for the spike in cases with the unreported testing. Is there any indication how common that mm -hmm. problem is, and how concerned should we you be? You know, about that, that's a great question, and um, nobody asked Alex a question yesterday, and I'm going to ask him to come answer that question today because he's not earning his pay. Um, <laughs> he took a field trip with me Wednesday, and he's been off ever since. It seems like. Um, Look, we do know that there are more tests coming online. Uh, I'm sorry, more labs coming online. Uh, and, and sometimes um, it's going to take a bit to get them into the fold fully and reporting every day the way that we want them to, to report. Um, and, and so we're doing everything we can to pre be proactive and reach out to them, remind them of what their obligations are uh, to report uh, to the Department of Health and to CDC, by the way, uh, every day their test results, both po positives and negatives. Um, but to the extent that this is going to continue to happen, Alex may have a better idea of how many more labs we expect to come online over time. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think uh, it, it's hard to give an actual number because uh, part of what's underlying this is, is our desire to know all of the test reporting or all the tests that's, that's happening statewide. Um, we do know that there are many uh, sites that have now these point-of-care tests. You've heard about them before. Um, and, and actually, when talking with the federal government, they noted that they felt that there was some maybe 600,000, something number like that, that was just not being reported to them either. These are being reported to nobody because one of the first things we tried to do was surge the number of labs in the state that could be, re that could be testing. Um, a lot of smaller labs uh, do not have the capacity to do the electronic lab reporting that our bigger labs do. And so what my team's been working on is really reaching out and working with, with those individually to make sure that they had uh, uh, an understanding of the platform for reporting and then were able to do that consistently. So my, uh, uh, the team is telling us that over the next two weeks we'll continue to see these occasionally. Um, I, I wouldn't expect that we're going to see um, you know, this on a, on a daily basis necessarily, but I know of at least one lab that's going to be in the larger size uh, as well. And so what we're going to do uh, going forward is you know, first of all, we're going to report the number, you know, as we have it, and then give you the context like we did today and say, you know, if we hadn't had those numbers, this is what we'd be looking at with those numbers. This is, this is what that looks like. And, you know, the labs we brought in today went back as far as March. So, so just to give a sense of this is, this is testing that's been going on in the state. We're going to be in a better position looking at gating criteria, knowing that we're getting as much lab reporting as, as, uh, as possible going forward. So we'll try to give you as much uh, warning and nuance uh, about those going forward. And that's why we're also, when we look at gating criteria, looking at symptoms, the syndromic surveillance, and hospitalization. So even as we see this increase in cases, that, that getting testing out to communities 
will necessarily do and which is good, that's not going to skew the overall picture that we get by looking at those other two factors. And that's, I think, a really, a really key matter. Keep in mind as well, we're going to continue updating on a weekly basis our estimate of people who have recovered um, over time. And that's another big thing that we're looking at, you know, what's our burden of uh, COVID-19 in the state. And so those cases, even if they're added to the overall chart, if they're old enough, they probably would be covered in that recovered number as well. So you'll see, you'll see a lot of that going forward. And, and we understand for the people we appreciate, uh, I think 20-something 20, 20 million individuals who have uh, uh, you know, been refreshing and looking at our dashboard, we appreciate the, the vigilance uh, of the public and following along. We want to make sure that it's clear to them what we're doing is sharing the data as we have it as transparently as, as possible. And, you got an early paper. Okay. <laughs> Sir. Uh, you got a heat map up the other day, and I can understand the spike in cases in urban areas, Baton Rouge and Lafayette, but I'm not quite sure about why northeast Louisiana seems to be going red, unless because that's mostly a rural area. I'm from there. So I just wanted to know, what what, what do you think would be causing that? So so there's, there can be a number of reasons, and we don't, the, the first answer I can give you is I don't know specifically what's driving that. One is, we know that there's areas across the state that, again, we still need to get more testing in. So we're now giving you down to the parish level data about what's the total test performed on residents of that parish. We're looking at that data internally to understand, do we have enough reach into that community? Uh, and, and where we don't, we're you know, pushing testing resources there to see if, um, uh, if we, can, we can identify more people. As we do that, you know, you're going to see these pockets of increased infection that come from that, or increase, sorry, you're going to see these pockets of increased cases that come from that, just like the pockets that we just talked about with a new laboratory suddenly reporting its old data. But I, I will say, when we look at the north, we do have a pattern where we saw uh, plateaued hospitalizations, back to the data that we were looking at over the weekend, so plateaued hospitalizations across, um, you know, the Shreveport corridor all the way to Monroe. Um, we are seeing case increases as well. Um, especially in the Monroe area, and we are concerned um, with that pattern. We want to make sure that uh, we have as much diligence in practicing social distancing, in, in staying at home, in hopefully, you know, if they're not already, in wearing masks, um, and all the things that we want to do, staying home certainly if you're sick, um, going forward, because those are areas that we're watching very closely, and those are, those are trends that, that are not comforting in the same way that when we look at the Greater New Orleans area and we see this clear drop in everything, I mean, that's what we really want to see statewide. So this may be for you and the governor. Um, we know the Department of Corrections tested 155 prisoners at a women's prison in St. Gabriel, and nearly 75% came back positive, some of whom didn't exhibit symptoms. Is what can be done to help mitigate that, and is that an indication that we need to continue on the path of testing more asymptomatic people in those facilities where they're crowded together? Yeah, and so just as the, as the governor said, you know, so that, that pattern uh, is something that we've seen in a number of facilities in the state and, and in talking with Ambassador Burks uh, and, and others, uh, that is a pattern that's being seen nationally. The CDC has released at least two reports, one about a nursing home in Seattle, another one about a homeless um, uh, facility in Seattle. And in both of those cases, there were significant individuals who at the time of the first case being identified were asymptomatic. Now, many of those go on to develop symptoms on retest, um, or uh, rather they go on to develop symptoms uh, even though they're positive. But our concern is all that period of time where we know that virus was being shed before they have symptoms. So as I think we talked about maybe even at the beginning of the week, um, we are, uh, we've been working with the CDC to understand their, their evidence and develop guidance really about what we do in those settings across the state. And, and, and what you'll see is us uh, certainly leaning into doing more testing in those settings where we really want to get a sense of everybody that could possibly be um, shedding virus and then that'll mean that we're, there's going to be more repeat setting or more repeat testing in those settings as well because just being negative on that first check doesn't mean that you won't turn negative in a few days and our goal with all these settings especially nursing homes where um, uh, we know that individuals who are at higher risk for complications and poor outcomes from COVID our goal is to identify as early as possible and, and, then, and then isolate individuals who could be shedding virus so that we can really try to maintain as much as possible a population of individuals who are never um, really exposed. So this is clearly a hot spot, though, at this prison. I guess now that the testing has been done, what's next? What, what's the step that comes after the testing? Because I'm not sure you can isolate 117 people. So I, I would defer exactly what the plan is on, on isolation to the Department of Corrections. I'm sure that they're, they're solving around that. I think we are working with them on you know what are the methods you know again same as what we do for uh, a nursing home or any other facility 
um, we have a, 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 a essentially a, a structured assessment uh, called the Infection Control Assessment and Response Plan, where we comprehensively go from the top to bottom, uh, you know, not only looking at the population that's in, infected or potentially exposed, but also what are your practices, what's your, your protective equipment availability, all those things, and we're working with them closely on that, same as we do for any facility uh, around the state. For Dr. View as well. Yes, sir. Um, the FDA just gave um, temporary approval for the drug, I can't pronounce it. Remdesivir. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, for treatment, obviously, it's being used here in Baton Rouge next week at an area hospital. Um, as far as doctor perspective, can you talk, talk about that being used for treatment um, and maybe in layman's terms as well for people to understand kind of what it will look like? So, so the, the study that, that Dr. Fauci talked about on Wednesday um, is one that's being conducted in a number of international settings and really in patients who were hospitalized. It's important for folks to know that. We're not talking about general public. That wasn't the study that was done. It was a very large study, over 1,000 patients. And so being a large study means that we have a little bit more confidence. Actually, we have a lot more confidence than in the kind of results that come back. Now, this was a study that was planned to go much further. But uh, all studies have, or especially studies that deal with patients, have what's called a data safety monitoring board. And the goal of that board is to periodically get updates on data. And if there's a sign of harm or a sign of clear benefit, to call it early and say you, there's no longer um, a question of whether there's a benefit here. It's no longer ethical to have people get placebo to get a, a, the non-active drug. Um, and, and that's what happened here. Essentially, the data safety monitoring board looked at the data and said there is a clear significant decrease in the amount of time people who get this drug are spending in the hospital. I believe it was 11 versus 14 days um, a difference. And so uh, that, that made them feel uh, that, that they needed to, to stop the trial and give the option of starting the drug on those other individuals rather than sort of watching to see how they do. The other thing that they were looking for, their secondary output or uh, uh, outcome, was mortality, the death uh, associated. If, if somebody takes this drug, do we reduce death? And there was a reduction. It was not what we call significant, where we apply statistical methods and we say, um, uh, you know, if we had this data, uh, enough of these data, would we feel strongly enough that 95% of the time there would be a, a difference uh, between taking the drug and not taking the drug? They didn't quite meet that goal, but there was a difference between 11% um, death in the general um, untreated public in these trials and 8% uh, for those who were getting the drug. So again, that did not yet prove statistically significant, but our hope is that if there is broader ac uh, access to that drug as we learn more about it, that there may be a real difference there. Uh, certainly our hope is that there's a number of therapies that get developed that will create a big difference in mortality, certainly heartening data um, uh, in, in the near term. So as far as this drug being used as a treatment, it's for patients that are hospitalized with COVID that are seeing, I That's guess, correct. stronger symptoms? So if they're hospitalized for, for, for COVID, it, they didn't uh, just limit it to people in an intensive care unit setting. Um, I have not seen the data myself, so I don't know if there would be any differences in those settings. But it's not for the general public who have a positive test, uh, and it's not a drug that's being tested, or that, at least this data was not about you know, using it to prevent somebody from getting infected. This is really just those people who had a clear diagnosis and were in the hospital where they were doing the study. All right. Hopefully I've Thank you. It. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, and, and Dr. Fauci said that really the, the exciting thing here wasn't just that we've, it appears that we have a therapeutic treatment that is effective and safe, uh, although it's limited to those who are in the hospital, but, but they have an idea of how remdesivir works. And so this gives more pharmaceutical uh, companies an opportunity to take that approach, refine it, uh, and have it be more effective and potentially more effective across a larger um, a segment of, of the COVID positive population, and so it's 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 just it's a building block, and so this this may be the very first uh, uh, safe and effective therapeutic treatment that becomes just the building block for for others, and and that's where uh, where I think he was most excited the other day, and it just so happened that this news broke uh, while uh, Alex was sitting on the couch next to Dr. Tony Fauci. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, do you have any plans to go to any restaurants this weekend, and, and would you feel comfortable doing so? I would feel comfortable going to a restaurant outdoors. Um, I would. Um, the, the question was whether I have plans. Uh, I don't have plans until my wife tells me what they are. Um, but but if that's what she wants to do, then, then I'm sure that we will. Uh, and it's going to be a, a beautiful weekend. And, and again, we're encouraging people to get outdoors uh, safely. 
especially to exercise. It helps relieve stress. It helps you to stay in good uh, condition and, and so forth. And I think we're going to have some great weather. Um, and, and we do ask people to go out and take advantage of this weather and take advantage of the opportunity you have to, to eat at a restaurant uh, on premises outdoors, remembering to wear your mask to and from your table, uh, making sure that you're social distancing from, from others who are not part of your immediate household um, and, and just do everything else that we've been talking about. Uh, but if, if it wasn't a, a safe thing to do, we would not be, be allowing it uh, in terms of, of the lessening of the restrictions that, that we have in place as of today. So I, I want to thank you all uh, for, again, for covering this as you have. Um, and I, I greatly look forward to the day. Don't know when it's going to be here uh, when we have other uh, things that are that are really the headline news um, here in Louisiana and across the country. Uh, but until then, we're going to we're going to do everything we can uh, to keep the people of Louisiana safe in this uh, practically unprecedented. I guess it's unprecedented in our lifetimes anyway. Uh, public health emergency with this uh, pandemic, um, and I do want to uh, encourage the people of Louisiana to continue uh, to do what they can to comply with the stay home order. Uh, good hygiene, social distancing, so that we can uh, stop the spread. Uh, make sure that uh, we meet those those threshold criteria, uh, and that we can move forward with a continued easing of restrictions, uh, and and open up more of our economy, get more of our businesses open, get more people back to work, but do all of that in a way that protects public health, that doesn't see a spike in cases, uh, so that we then maybe have to to hit the brakes for a while. Um, and so I'm just asking folks to, to be focused on that. Uh, we will get through this together, uh, I can assure you. Uh, so God bless. We will, you'll be getting some more information from a, uh, our communications team about the next press conference, when and where uh, that's going to be. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.